discussing the mental health and mental well-being of men could not be more relevant because of the day and age that we live in. And I just said that, sadly, um, somebody just sent me a message less than two hours ago about uh, a well-known figure in the financial sector in Nigeria who um, has died by suicide uh, within the next last couple of days. So uh, uh, men's, and the other reason why men's mental health is really important is because we are now seeing that there is a, a difference between how men, interact with our emotions and how women do uh, and um, i'm going to be sharing some statistics sharing some data um, very shortly just to um, share thoughts and just buttress that point so this is tripart care emotional well-being hub it's a safe sensitive uh, spiritual online space where we discuss mental health in a way that is relevant in a way that people can relate to and in a way that is digestible so that nuggets can be taken and applied to everyday living so that anyone who joins can feel that they've got something that they can then take up and really work on and we we are particularly we have a Chris, christian ethos it's a christian organization i've always um, been very upfront about the fact that i'm a believer in christ and that that guides uh, my entire life um so that whilst the information that we share is relevant to everyone uh, we also target uh, particularly uh, the great, great Christian community. And also, whilst the information that we share is relevant to all ethnic groups, we also um, pay specific attention to people from um, ethnic minority backgrounds, particularly from the Black ethnic minority background. And that's because we also do know that sometimes we are least likely to um, get this information or to even engage with the services that are available. So that's who we are and what we do. Uh, Tripart Care Emotional Wellbeing Hub has been running since February 2021. And uh, we've, we usually host these events on the last Thursday of the month. And it's always online. Uh, uh, but even though there are several things that happen, happen offline in terms of interaction um, that you get to know about soon. So I've done the welcome and just by way of introduction, my name is Dr. T. Ayodele Ajay. I'm a consultant psychiatrist and I work in the NHS and I also wear a number of hats. Uh, I also do write regular columns. I'm a mental health columnist, and I sit on a number of, of charities, uh, boards of a number of charities, both in the UK and also um, some public charities um, are working in Nigeria. And um, I, I enjoy, I'm a public mental, I also see myself as a public mental health educator because that's something I've done for many, many years. I've had the privilege of speaking to church groups um, since about 20, since about the turn of the century, since about 2001. And over the time, uh, it has helped me to develop a feel of what is re really relevant to our community. So um, the tripart care module, which we follow, is, is a biopsycho spiritual module. And I will tell you what that means. Basically, it just means that we look at mental health not only from the biological point of view, not only from the psychological point of view in terms of how people think, in terms of um, tools to live life, but also in terms of spiritual, uh, in also looking at a spirit, the spiritual aspect, because we do know that really there's now a lot of literature out there showing that uh, there is a is a need to to focus on the spiritual aspects of our being, particularly when it comes to mental health and mental well-being. So that that's the model we adopt, and that's what we use to look at. So we have a very rounded and holistic approach. Regarding cameras, um, I'm going to ask that everyone please um, feel free to either switch on your camera or switch off your camera. However, please be muted um, so that everyone can have a positive experience of this meeting tonight. In terms of self-care, sometimes when we talk about some of these issues, they might be triggering. Somebody might find that I say something or somebody else makes a comment or put something in the chat that triggers them in terms of giving them, bring, bringing back memories or causing them distress. If you're in such a position, uh, please do, don't do um, leave that way. Uh, please do send um, 
send a personal message to me um, so that we can make sure that you are well taken care of and that you don't live in distress. And then there is going to be a question and answer uh, session at the end of the of the present of, the, of this presentation. And just to also say, a lot of you know that we have a YouTube channel and it's by the same name, Tripod Care. I encourage everyone to please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, there are about 65 videos on there currently, and there are many more that will be coming. And what we do is that we upload the videos from these sessions onto, tripod, onto the Tripod Care Professional Wellbeing Hub. And this is after we have edited them so that, uh, so that no confidential information is, is put online. And, if by all, if by any means you don't want to um, feature in the videos by any means, please just use um, a pseudonym so that you are not recognizable in any of the videos. And also to say that we have a WhatsApp group. Um, and if you are interested in the WhatsApp group, at the end of the session, the QR code to register for the was to join the WhatsApp group is available. There are quite a number of um, there are quite a number of groups that we've got. We've got a book club. We are currently looking at um, a book on trauma. Um, Why Am I This Way? Um, written by, by Kobe Campbell. Really very insightful book. That's what we are um, looking at at the moment. And the final thing is at the end of the meeting, um, I'm also going to be making an announcement about um, a, a, another niche, particularly niche service that um, Tripart Care will be pro providing. Um, just because this is a, a public mental health education event, I want I want to let everyone know that it's just for, info, for informational purposes only. It does not replace advice or counsel from your doctor or from your healthcare professional. Um, and whilst I've made the efforts to make sure that all the information is timely, is relevant, and it's accurate, um, it's difficult to assume, we, we are not assuming any responsibilities. So it's important if you are making any major, any decisions about your mental health and about your care at all, please do consult with your healthcare provider. That could be your psychiatrist, your psychologist, your healthcare or your primary care provider in terms of your family doctor or your general practitioner. And also to say that I've said, I've said before, that this event, this event is now going to be recorded. It's going to, it's been recorded and it's going to be uploaded after editing. Um, so let's let's start from the basics. The, the way I want to start this evening is this. I would like to um, challenge everyone. I'm hoping, I really anticipate and I desire, and it's my earnest desire and prayer that this event today will be a, transform, a transformational one that really everyone will go, particularly our men, will go with tools that you are able to use in your life and can bring life in the way you go about your life and in the way, and that spills into your job, it spills into every aspect of your life. So, and the way I feel, the, the way I, I uh, that can be done is if we decide today that we're going to do three things, we're going to scribe, write things down. I encourage you to get a pen and paper or get um, something a writing material of, it, of some sort, and please take points down. I also encourage you to share this, share with people that you may feel that they need to be here now, but also maybe people who are un unable to attend, let them know about, because I do feel that we do, that we do bring up the thoughts that are going to be shared today are going to be transformational and they're going to be uh, life-changing. So please share with somebody. And of course, the other thing is when you then make your decisions about what you are going to do, I encourage you to also please get support. Sometimes um, lifestyle changes, sometimes transformation takes time and we need a body. We need somebody who is, who is budding with us, who is cheering us on and whom, who is pulling us up at the times when we find it challenging. So one of the ways you can make that happen is to get somebody, a friend, to say, oh, please hold me accountable to the things that I said I'm, I'm going to be doing. And of course, the other thing is that there's what is called the law of diminishing return, that the longer you stay to do what you need to do, the longer it takes you to actually action what you need to do, the less likely that you're ever going to action those, those things that you've agreed to do. So I'm encouraging you that very, very early from about 9 p.m. tonight, when even before we finish, begin to think about what you're going to do in action and try and take it the small, the smallest first step. Try and do something in terms of um, taking a step that is really going to help you to uh, 
to achieve your goal and to get to where you need to be. So um, we've talked about archiving, um, recording, taking action quickly, accountability, and of course, assessment. The final one is assessment. Um, do try and set yourself goals in terms of two days, um, maybe a week's time, what you're going to, what, what you're uh, reviewing your action uh, in the week's time, in, two, in, in a month's time, in three months, and ever so often that way. In that case, you can see and monitor your progress. And um, so that's, I think that's all the intro. And what are the goals for today? Really, I'm sure that we have all seen the flyers. And what are the goals? One, uh, I'm hoping, I, I expect that everyone will be able to gain, particularly our men, be able to gain an understanding of the reason why we respond in certain ways, the reason why we do emotions certain ways, the reason why some men don't engage with services, the reason why we don't go to our GPs, the reason why we don't do certain things we ought to do and do certain things that we ought not to do as men. Um, I'm hoping that after today, there will be some insight regarding that. The other thing I'm hoping to do is that um, I'm also hoping that we can better understand ourselves as men. We can better gain an understanding um, in terms of who we are. And then, importantly, challenging stereotypes, um, toxic stereotypes that are associated with, man, with manliness in society. I think if we all form a group where we are all up for, for that to challenge the stereotypes, then we can, we can go far. And uh, men also being able to identify uh, to engage and identify support. Um, support is always available with our mental well-being, but it's important that we're able to identify that and also engage with it. And um, and of course, for the dear women in our lives to know, you see, every ever so often, the interesting thing is that very often I hear about the mental health of men from women. It's the mothers, it's the aunties, is the sisters, is the wives, is the spouses, is the girlfriends that um, that come up and say, or the fiancés that come up and say, I think there's something challenging uh, with the mental of the man in my life, but he's not doing anything about it. So I hear more about the mental health of men from women than I hear from men. And I'm hoping that those women, uh, when I advertised this, this meeting, I said, uh, this is the thing that women have been talking to me about, and I'm hoping that this will really address the need today. The, the fact that uh, a lot of women say, oh, um, I hope I can help my husband. I hope I can help my spouse. Um, so I'm hoping that also the women in the group can um, find something. Um, and of course, how did, how, in terms of immense emotion, how do we evolve and get to this point? How, how, what is it that, that explains the psyche of a man in terms of the way we interact with life and in terms of the way we do emotions or uh, and in, in terms of our minds? Uh, what are the mental statistics that we know about that really talk to men particularly? Um, the statistics regarding suicide, the statistics regarding depression, they, they are quite unique when you think about them in terms of the male gender. And of course, um, I expect that every one of us will be able to do some sort of soul search in terms of really where we are currently and to be able to take something home that we can apply uh, going forward. And very often as well, we, we hear people who say, oh, I, I want to talk to my friend. I know my friend is depressed. I can see the telltale signs, but the challenge I'm having is that I don't know where to start. I'm not a mental professional. I'm really struggling with how to engage in that conversation. I don't have the tools, I don't have the skills. Uh, the A to G emotional distress conversation checklist is really something that would um, I expect will be able to help everyone to be able to um, get to that space where they feel confident to talk about these things with other men. So, and then at the end of the day, we are going to share some resources and then take answers and questions. So let's start from this very interesting slide. Uh, and this is what it says, uh, really that are male human brains different from female brains? And I'm quite keen to hear from you. Let's, let's start. This is usually very interactive. I'm quite keen to hear from you. What do the floor think? What do the house think? Do we feel that the brain of, of, of men uh, are different 
from the brains of women, please. Surprise, surprise. I know this is going to surprise you, and I'm quite willing to share literature, to share citation. The answer is that surprisingly, the latest um, study of studies shows that there's really hardly any difference between the male brain and the female brain. At autopsies, if they open up, um, if somebody, a pathologist is presented with a brain, it's not possible to tell if they, they hadn't known who the brain was from. It's not possible to tell whether that brain was from a man or a woman, interestingly. Now, um, I know that there are a lot of intellectuals um, and people who are interested in neuroscience in the house. The, there's a, the latest one, the, 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 most, the, the most authoritative, I think, is um, a study was carried out in, um, in, the, in, in Chicago, and they actually found out that what they did was that they studied all the studies, they pulled together all the studies that looked at the human brain, particularly to do with gender differences, and they found out that there was really any difference. Um, <laughs> it's been traditionally believed that they... We, the, the, between the two lobes of the brain, that women have more connection between the left and the right low, uh, right, um, what are called the hemispheres. And then also, um, it's also been believed that men, that in the men's brain, that we tend to have more connection between the front and the back parts of our brain. When they looked at all the studies that have looked at all those uh, data, what they found was that there was no consistency. Um, um, there was no consistency in the in, in the in, in the in the in the data in the replication when they looked at different countries uh, they, they weren't able to find a consistent and replicable um, um, evidence that shows that the man's brain is different from the woman's brain the only thing they found was consistently was that on the overall on the average the a man's the male brain is usually about 10 to 10 about 10 11 percent bigger than the women's brain and so when we think about it, that the average brain is about 1.5 kilograms or less than that, or about 1.4, 1.5 kilograms. And that 10% is really about 0 0.1 gram uh, difference. So the reality is that um, it's, it's um, contrary to what we used to believe, um, that does not happen. Um, and the reason why I've made um, that point is because if we know that the man's brain and the and the, the male brain and the female brain are more or less the same, that there is no consistent, uh, replicable difference in those brains, then we can come to one conclusion, and that conclusion is this: that whatever is then happening in the differences that we see in in, in mental well-being must have a lot to do with what's happening in the environment rather than the way that men that we are wired um, and that that's quite so I think that's a good place to start today that really we need to be when we look at all the differences that I'm going to be talking about today we need to be looking at what is happening in our environment what's happening around us that's actually causing these differences I mean the, the most prominent one for for instance is, is the suicide rate uh, between men men and women we are it's consistently higher Every, it, it, it costs globally, uh, globally, it's consistently higher in men than in women. Um, and that, that's something that is very well known. So, so this slide says that give me a child until he's seven years old and I will show you the man. Because we are now getting into the territory in which we are beginning to try and get into the head of us as men, as males. What exactly is, is it that makes us um, interact with our emotions the way we do? And this, this, this quote is either credited to Ignatius of Loyola or to Aristotle. And, and that's really so accurate that by the time that, that the things that we, the way we interact with a child or, or a male child or a female child up until their seventh year can have profound effects on the way they then live their lives and engage with life going forward. It's almost like you build a template. It's almost like you form a foundation and that includes their emotions. Uh, and I think that that's really the, the point that um, we, it's really good that we start from uh, today. So what is the what are the things that are happening? What are the experiences that we have as males that shape the way we grow and that shape our emotional life 
going forward. What are the, those experiences? One of them is childhood and societal conditioning. The fact that I don't know of any culture, I'm yet to find out about any culture where it's not expected that a man is meant to be stoic, a man is meant to be invincible, a man is meant to be without no vulnerabilities and not to show any weakness. It's almost like it's, it's a standard practice. It's almost like we are born with that manual. As soon as you come out of your mother's womb, you are handed to it by society, you are handed to it by your parents, you are handed to it by community. Everybody just expects men don't cry, men don't do emotions. And those things then begin to form, it's almost like they form a template. They all, it's almost like we, we get, they, they, they begin to form a message that we carry with us uh, without even knowing it. And it begins to shape our decisions. It shapes the way we interact. It shapes the way we behave through our, across board. So there's something about the message that uh, we feed to, to boys, to, to young adults who are, who are men, to, um, to, to the male community that makes us feel that we must always have everything all together or at all, all times. And the interesting thing is it's then made us to conclude that actually men don't like to talk about their emotions or to talk about their mental health. Research proves otherwise, interestingly. And I want to say that in my I feel blessed that I've had the opportunity to speak to several countless men over the years, countless men. Um, and particularly in the last three years. And I'm getting to know that indeed, I'm not just reading about research that shows that men crave to talk. I'm seeing it every single talk, every single encounter I have with men who talk about the most intimate emotions of theirs. I'm finding that really what men are saying is that the reason why I'm not talking is not because I don't have anything to say or I don't have the skills to talk, but the reason why I'm not talking is because I'm looking for, a, for safety. I'm afraid of being vulnerable. I'm afraid of stigma, judgment, rejection, and ridicule. And if all of that is taken away and I feel safe with you, when I test the waters and I see that it's okay, then I will open up to you. That's what I am seeing as I That's what I'm, I'm hearing. That's what I'm witnessing. And the other thing I'm hearing and witnessing is, which also supports literature, is that past negative experiences um, is also a deterrent from men opening up in com those conversations. When I say past negative experiences, I'm talking about when a man has confided in, in somebody and he's been thrown back at their face, they've confided in their manager and uh, it's been used against them at work, they've confided in a spouse and it's been, it's been used against them during, during, uh, during a, a, maybe during an argument, they've confided in a, a brother or a sister and it's been used against them when it comes to uh, settling the, 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 the parents' will. All of those things um, can really be very, can really shape the way us men decide to talk or not to speak up or not to speak up. And of course, the other thing is the lack of safe spaces. The fact that men will only talk when they feel it's okay. It's super safe to be vulnerable. And the reality is that we're all, we all afraid of, we, we all in one way or the other fear being vulnerable. Because one of the reasons why vulnerability is a big deal is that when we become vulnerable, we give away power. Basically, vulnerability means that you're exposing yourself, you are, you are basically giving away power. And there is always a concern about how, when I give that power away, how does it make me? In what position does it put me? Does it make me defenseless? But the interesting thing is that in medicine, there's always something called the risk, um, risk, risk benefit, risk and benefit analysis, where you look at the, the risks of a decision and the, and the benefits of it. And sometimes, despite the risks, because the benefits outweigh the risk, you go for the risk. And in this case, I dare say that in my experience, in my personal experience, in the experience of speaking to men all over, um, I think it's always worth the risk when we find a safe space to let down our guards and take off our masks and become vulnerable. The reality is that I found out that every man, your your what you want to talk about comes in different shades, sizes, and 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 seasons and and shapes and shades. But at the end of the day, there's something common about us, and that's our humanness. So um, 
The other thing I find is that somebody who works in, in, in mental services is that there is also inadequate male or diverse representation in talking therapy professions. Um, the, the reality is that we, many times men say, oh, yeah, I, I, I would have wanted to be able to interact with somebody who gets the man. But let, let's face it. We Yes, thank God there are quite a lot of male psychiatrists. Yeah, they are quite... Uh, but when it comes to talking therapies, the reality is that we don't have a lot of men in that in that field correctly. And also, it's not just that we don't have a lot of men, we also don't have a lot of diversity. Uh, I think in the UK, for instance, um, I think in the UK, about 98% of people who are in talking professions, particularly who are psychologists, clinical psychologists, identify their background as white Caucasian. So that, that gives us um, um, a just... Um, a sense of how things are. So the other thing is language, which I'm coming to. Um, the other thing, obviously, it's language, the language that we use when we are dealing with, um, when we are dealing with emotions, <clears throat> talking uh, with men. And I'm hoping that today, one of my expectations, one of the things that I really, um, I desire is that that narrative of isolation among men will begin to change. That not only would we, for those who have our nearest and dearest, not only would we, would, we, would we be able to feel comfortable about exposing our hearts and, and our emotions, our challenges um, in terms of our emotional well-being to, to our spouses, to family members, but also um, that we would have peers that we can really form a neatly close um, close network of a few people that we feel vulnerable with and we feel it's safe to be vulnerable. Um, and that's what this slide is really about. So um, getting men to talk, what, what, what did we find? What, what, uh, or what does the literature tell us in terms of what are the things that we need to do in order to create that safe space for men to talk? Because the reality is that, uh, as I've said, if the space is not there, if men don't feel safe, men don't talk. It's just the, it's just the bottom line. Um, I, I, I'm aware that there are quite a number of um, comments on the chat, and I'm going to come to them. Thank you for putting all those comments, and please keep them coming. So um, research has shown that angular rather than direct approach is called health by filth. It means that men don't usually engage with confrontational, upfront uh, talks about mental health. Okay, oh yeah, let's go out and talk about your mental health. No, men don't have to do those. Um, it's, it's a bit too direct, it's a bit too disempowering. But what research is showing that when there's a shared activity like fishing, like um, woodwork, like hunting, like walking in the woods, like going on long drives in the wild together or going on long walks in the wild together, sitting down together to play a video game or to watch football together or sitting down together at the pub, that people tend, men tend to value such activities and tend to open up more. Um, when the situation is that way, uh, because it's not, it's less, it's less confrontational, it's less threatening, and a lot of a lot of men find that more engaging and easier because the emphasis is on the activity rather than on the man, and so that that space can be safe, feels to be safe. The other one is what's called shoulder to shoulder, not face to face. So I can. Uh, um, to, today I'm speaking to you virtually uh, in a face-to-face -face manner, but they're still virtual. It's still virtual, so there's still some protection. But what research also shows is that men prefer to talk in situations where they are having a. So you are you are walking shoulder to shoulder to somebody. You are not. It's, it's not a face-to-face -face sort of situation. Um, and people find there's, there's quite a lot of, of things that have been written about that, that men don't talk face to face, but men talk shoulder to shoulder, really where, where. And, and there's also, I suppose there's quite uh, some sense to that because when in, in, in the next slide, we are going to talk about how the power imbalance, power imbalance can be a deterrent from men opening up about emotions. That if a man, if you, you want to speak to another man about, uh, uh, if you want to speak to another man about uh, about their emotional well-being, and you are coming as a superior, I found that that doesn't work. 
Um, and so for, for some of us who are mental professionals, maybe we want to talk to people in our social life, in our social settings. When I go into those uh, conversations, I never go as a professional. I go as a friend. I go as a brother. I go as, uh, as a community member, one brother to the other. And I found that that usually works. And in the, in the coming slides, I'm going to share some of the principles that I have used that I have found that it works. And so there's also men's shed. That the concept of, of, of shoulder to shoulder is actually from men's shed, uh, which is associated and men's shed where men gather together and they, they have a shared task. It could be gardening, it could be woodwork, whatever it is, some of the things I've, I've spoken about today. Uh, that's actually the concept of men's shed. I think it started from Australia, but it's growing. So men's shed, uh, the concept of men's shed is a very powerful one. And there is now research showing that it's not only associated with improved mental health, there's also reduced loneliness, isolation, depressive symptoms, and suicidality. So really, there are things that work for men. Uh, which is good news. So we are not in a place in which we are just throwing up our hands and thinking, oh, we, we haven't got solutions. There are solutions out there. Uh, it's just about implementing them. And I'm hoping that uh, I know that we've got people from varied backgrounds here. Some, some of us are service providers, mental service providers. Some of us are mental champions. Some of us have come for our spouses. Some of us have come because we are looking for tools for ourselves. I'm hoping that some of these conversations, particularly as we open up conversation, um, and please, as you get thoughts, please just continue to put them on the on the chat and then the other thing is use of non-clinical language enhances en en engagement with men use of non-clinical language so when when i interact with men in outside of work uh, for instance the one-to-one -one coaching that i do I, i've i don't very commonly happen about therapy or about consultations i talk about meetings i talk about coaching, I talk about uh, appointments, um, because that's more empowering language. A man is more likely to relate to that because we are not saying, oh, you are broken. Because if somebody is coming to therapy, the concept that we've got is that that person is broken and men, don't, we don't like to be broken. Even though, of course, every one of us, there's no one who has had the experiences in their lives that have um, either in one way or the other might not be major traumas but they've had some some of from trauma and that shapes us but that's disempowering for us men so we don't like to do that of course the final the other point in terms of really getting men to talk as we consider these things is really the use of role models and i've put some initials here martin luther king is one of the most prominent black men known in the history of, of, of black people um, in terms of the impact that he has made. However, the man actually suffered, he struggled with depression. He did struggle with depression. A lot of people probably don't know that, but he did. And this is something in the literature. Um, it's maybe more contemporary, we've got Tyler Perry, uh, the, the guy in Hollywood who's, uh, who's taking his faith to Hollywood and he's, he's, um, a, a very pub, he's very public about his Christian faith. Um, um, the, and he's done the Madea series and all those um, films. Uh, there, is, there is Frank Bruno, the heavyweight. I mean, I was thinking about this and thinking, how, how tough can a man get in terms of what more um, engaging, what more manly sports than boxing? And, and um, Frank Bruno is quite upfront about the fact that he's had uh, problems with bipolar affective disorder and that, um, so, uh, that on occasions he's been in hospital, he's been detained in hospital. So um, these are people who, uh, and so um, I think it's important for people who have a platform men who have a platform and they've had lived experience of mental challenges um, to come out and talk about it and sort of break that stigma um, and address it. Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson is another one uh, who, and of course, over here in the UK is uh, David Harwood, um, who David Harwood is, is a play, is a, is a film director, um, very well known in the UK. And he has also spoken about his experience of being sectioned in the past, being detained in hospital. Um, and um, I just wanted to, in, in terms of, um, let's just look now at some of the language that um, can we can think about um, adopting. And I want to acknowledge um, the thoughts and the very good work that um, a colleague, Dr. Esther Cole, has done in this line. I mean, this line, uh, Dr. Esther Cole is uh, 
the CEO of Lifespan Psychology. And she's written a very brilliant article, which I encourage anyone who is looking for really getting into the in-depth of, of use of language when it comes to engaging men. She's written a brilliant article on psychology today. You could Google it, Dr. Esther Cole on um, Lifespan Psychology, and that's a that's a name on the slide over there. Um, some of these thoughts um, have been, um, some of these thoughts that I'm sharing are actually um, gleaned from some of those articles, and some of them are from my own personal experience. So we talk about courses, we talk about programs, coaching, and not necessarily people, men don't necessarily want to talk about therapies or interventions, resilience training. Because at the end of the day, when you engage with, with the therapist, that's what we are, we are really doing. We are building resilience. We are building a capacity um, to be able to, to withstand um, adversity and come, up, come, up, uh, come, come, come out on top. It's still the same goal, but the language can be different. And the use of a different language can actually be powerful. And then we look, look at goals and not regrets. We talk about strengths and not weaknesses. Uh, we talk about solution because men are solution focused. We are goal getters. We want to we, we we look at we look for opportunities and we are looking for rather than focusing on the problem, we are looking at opportunities. And the use of the right language in personal conversations, because this is not just for professionals, the use of the right language can actually be so helpful in changing the narrative. And it can make the difference between having the next conversation and the next conversation and the next conversation. Because guess what? I put up my hands to admit that every time I speak to a man about their mental health, about their emotional well-being, what I'm hoping to do is that there can be a second conversation, there can be a third conversation, there can be an open door where they now feel that the conversation can continue. It can continue by WhatsApp. It can continue by text messages. It can continue one way or the other, such that the communication gap is open and they can feel safe to the point in which on the day it comes to crunch, on the day it comes to ground zero, they can actually reach out to me and then we can have a proper chat. So um, what are the other things that, and, and this is by, this is, um, this is something, that um, tripod care um, adopted or that we put together in terms of a checklist. I think this this been around since about 2002 or 2000, 2022 or 2023, one of them. Um, however, it's a checklist to look at when I want to have a conversation with another man or when I want to have a conversation. And it doesn't only work for men, it can work for anyone really. Uh, what are the things to look out for? I think the first thing is authenticity. In terms of really, a lot of us worry about, oh, that, that, what's that man going to think about me? I, I'm not a professional. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a, a mental nurse. I, I don't have a mental first aid. But that's not what the man is looking for. The man is looking for another genuine person, somebody who has a heart, somebody who has a soul, somebody who cares genuinely enough about them to, uh, uh, to, to uh, be able to engage in that process. Yeah. So somebody who has enough um, to, to be able to engage in that process. Those are the people, those are the type of people that men are looking for. And being cautious, the other thing, apart from authenticity, being bringing your full self, just bringing your genuine concern, the, uh, that's the A, that's authenticity. The B is being brave. Being brave in terms of being able to ask that question. Sometimes when you have the gut feeling, you just have a sixth sense that something is not okay. It's always better to ask than not to ask. Because sometimes you ask and you find out that that was a lifesaver. And there have been situations when I've asked and I was so glad I did because it didn't look like it, it was going to, it looked like I was just really being ambitious here by asking or I was just, really, really meaning to things. And thankfully I asked and it turned out to be a sensible thing to do. So what, what uh, So it's important that we are brave in asking. The other bravery I think we need to encounter, uh, to encounter is somebody says the greatest bravery is the bravery of being able to discipline yourself. That's the other bravery in terms of discipline ourselves to hold our tongues. When a man comes and he begins to spill his guts, it's not a time to begin to bring the advice out of the books. And men are wired to be problem solvers. So because we are like that, we are more likely to begin to, have you tried X, Y, and Z? And sometimes we end that conversation by saying man up. 
which is the wrongest thing to say. Um, it's like, it's your problem. You should just go and sort it out. I, I, it's, your, it's your deal, go and deal with it. That sort of thing. So I think it's important that we, I think it's important that we um, we um, we um, are aware of that. Confidentiality is another thing. Uh, confidentiality in terms of co confidentiality in terms of men would only continue to spill thoughts, continue to share thoughts that are very personal when we are sure that our thoughts are, prior, are not being, are not going to be in the headlines or they are not going to be shared with somebody else without our consent. And I usually, when I enter those conversations, I will usually say, the only reason I'll break confidentiality here and with your consent is if I find out that your life is at risk or the life of somebody else you've spoken to me about is, as a risk, is, is, at, is at risk as a result of what you are going to do. And even when that happens, we are going to together agree a plan to break confidentiality. Because in that case, I wouldn't be stabbing you in the back. I'm not going to be disloyal. I'm going to let you know that at this point, we need to get somebody else involved in order to keep you safe and in order to keep somebody else safe. The other thing is about distractions. So we are, we are on D now. Distract the, the, a 20, 30 year trauma that is still present in my life currently. And it's, it's affecting the way I show up every day in life. And it's affecting my relationship with my spouse, with my children, with work, and it's affecting my self-esteem. I certainly wouldn't want you to be on the phone at the time. I wouldn't want you to be looking at your text messages I, because the message you are giving back to me is that, or, or being distracted with what's happening around or what's on television or what's on Netflix. The message I'm going to pick up is that, it's not very important to him. I better just carry mine. I, I, I've always known this goal. It's going to be that way anyway. I just took a chance and it was the wrong move. I better just pack it all back in. I've been carrying it around for 30 years. I better just put it back into the folder, put the lid on it and not talk about it again. The challenge with that is when people have had a negative experience and these things happen. I mean, I, I re recall well that uh, there have been groups I've, I've attended where somebody where people have actually said really you are encouraging us to speak up as men but the reality is that sometimes when we speak up the type of response we get back is so discouraging that we decide never to do it again because it even becomes more humiliating so um distractions do get to take rid take get, get rid of the distractions and take care of them ahead of, of having those conversations and exchange exchange is such a great communication communication and, and enhancer great conversation enhancer being able to exchange experiences every time um, i go into those conversations I, i'm willing to give a bit of myself because if this a relationship that is at par, I'm not the superior, the person is not the junior, it's just a, a relationship that is on even level and there's a power, there's a power balance. Then if they are going to share of themselves, I should be willing to share of myself uh, of myself. And that's why um, I, I very freely share my experiences of the, the challenges that I've, I've had in my own emotional journey in terms of how I'm about to deal with grief and loss and, and the impact that that's had on me. Uh, people who, who are in my, people who have been to these meetings know um, that um, I'm, I'm, I don't hold back about sharing about the impact of losing my parents very close together and then my sister in between. All of those things and how I've had to deal with that and the, the impact is had on me and how it's a journey, it's a work in progress. I think that sharing those things means that I'm actually saying, Let's talk about this. I'm not. I'm not the superior here. I'm not like. I'm not on a high horse. Let's talk about these things. Um, everyone deals with loss. Everyone experiences loss, and it, you know, it's, it, it, there's no professional immunity against it. And of course, friendliness. Friendliness in terms of being able to end. Um, being able to keep the communication um, open, like I said, really remaining frankly. And of course, the last one is gratitude. Gratitude in terms of being able to be thankful that uh, that person has shared with me their thoughts. Um, that that person has shared with me their thoughts and that's something that I value. Yes, um, Dr. Dr. Tola, thank you, ma'am, for that. Being present when you are listening as well. Uh, really knowing um, the body language, the arming, the nodding of the head, yeah, the eye contact, um, if it's in a place where you can make eye contact, or just even uh, sometimes even your body language, an open body language can uh, really, or even the tone of your voice on the phone 
all of those can really uh, uh, all of those can can really be very helpful right so um let's go on to right so what what are the qualities that we can bring into those conversations i think i've talked about authenticity i've talked about being a good listener just holding our tongue and and not really uh wanting to jump in and, and give solutions because sometimes people are just looking to be listened to of course sometimes it's a different relationship if it's a coaching or mentoring even a coaching relationship is different if it's a mentoring relationship it may be obviously after one has listened and one understands then maybe one could give a few if it's appropriate but attentiveness is a very important thing mutuality being able to that that's the we are par reciprocity being able to exchange views uh, parity um i'm not the superior here uh, mutuality is that really this this um, the best of us this happens to us all uh, confidentiality in terms of really i'm going to hold your confidence i'm not going to break your trust um, I think it's it's really about being able that I'm not going to break your trust. Um, this is going to if if it's this is something that you want to remain between us, uh, that's fine as long as um, there's no need to, and of course celebration. And so I'm going to at this point I've been talking for a while and I'm quite keen to just change pace a bit. I'm going to stop sharing because I'm then going to uh, show a slide uh, i'm going to show a video slide it's a le very little clip it's just a two minute clip but it was between two highly qualified professionals one of them uh it was it is a director of a public uh, pu public health in in his uh, in, in a state in in, um, in the united states and the other one is also it's got a lively podcast um and they had if it, it was a 20 minute video but in in a two minute clip they had such a powerful powerful exchange that i was listening to this on saturday and i thought wow this is this this just typifies it just sums up all the message that i would like to share with men today it was just so it was just so on point that i thought this one and i i I'd like us to as we look at the video i i want us to look at what is what are the attributes that we can clean from there the authenticity the mutuality the parity let's just it's a very it's a very short video but it's really loaded um i'm just going to share that now uh okay yes so that's okay good okay i'm going to optimize that Brilliant. And could people just confirm, please type in the chat if you can hear it. I've been struggling with uh, type 2 diabetes for over 20 years. Can, can people hear it? On talk about that. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, I've gone through my low mood periods. Yeah, you and I share the, 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 the same thing in terms of the loss of a child. That's, oh, that's I, a, I didn't know that. Yes, we do. Yeah, so, it's, it's the most devastating absolutely. thing anyone could ever go through. Absolutely. You know, I get, I get emotional just uh, thinking about it. I'm, I'm very sorry that, that you had to go through yeah, that. Yeah, I for you also. However, mm -hmm. there is a different side of that coin. It yeah. says that we can, can uh, be down, um, mm -hmm. man down can become a man up. Uh, yes, in, I mean. In terms of depression associated with, with a loss of a loved one. Yeah, and it's so true, and I can speak to it on a personal level as you can. Uh, there were many, many days when I never thought I would get back up and um, was prepared to kind of live life down. Um, the smartest thing I think I did was my two best friends. Uh, I called them and I said, you know, once I get through all of the, you know, funeral arrangements, uh, promise me that you'll go for a walk with me at least once a week. And I don't even know where I came up with that. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they came through. The three of us would go walking once a week and just talking about anything and everything. And that slowly but surely helped me kind of get back to where, you know, I wanted to be.
Let's shift gears for just a minute. In the middle of the, the city of Flint's right, water crisis, uh, I know that your relocation to Flint yeah. uh, there, this is something. Good. Right. So any thoughts on that video? It's a very short one, but um, I thought it was a powerful exchange between those two middle-aged possibly nearing elderly men what 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 did you what what strikes you what what are what what did you get i mean what are your thoughts that that's a usual that Okay, was listening. Okay, somebody said he was listening. Okay, thank you. Support systems, vital to mental health. Absolutely, I agree with that. Um, solidarity, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I do agree with that. It, it's like it, it, they found a, a point of mutuality. Um, empathy, yes, there was quite a lot of empathy exchange between those two men. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The fact that they were relatable. Um, there was something, vulnerability on both sides, mutual exchange, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, seeking help when needed. Yeah. I mean, so this, this the, the older guy, the one who was being interviewed, is quite a leading name in, in, in that region. Um, and he was coming up and saying, actually, is, 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 is that is basically what he was describing was a depressive episode. He had gone through depression um, following bereavement. Uh, they, they spoke the same language. I agree as well. They, they were on the same page. There was something about I get you without saying it in words. What they, there was such a powerful exchange. I mean, I was listening to it in my car and thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. It was like, I mean, <laughs> even I could feel the impact of the exchange that was taking place in that little clip of conversation. Uh, and uh, it, it was the, the interviewer started by saying, by giving some disclosure, he said he could relate to the fact that that he had also lost uh, a child and that, that was where this did this. So, I, I, and I think that in these conversations, there's always something that we can relate to from the other person, something that we can pick up on, something that can really, absolutely, yeah, they were soft spoken, not as, <laughs> not as animated as I am now, <laughs> because I'm really getting excited about it. Transparency and honesty, absolutely. Thank you. Um, um, thank you for all those comments. Um, yeah, and then there were, there were relationships before their challenges. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Thank you for that, Tima, because, yeah, it, it, that's the reason why we need to build those relationships. I mean, look at what he did. He said three of his friends should just go on it, go with him on walks. And every week, those people committed to it. And that was where his healing and recovery came. Just talking about probably, I'm sure that it wouldn't have been on the agenda every day that, oh, how are you feeling today? It would just have been a very natural course of moving um, into, 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 those, in, in, into those conversations. And he was able to, the listener was also very validating. Thank you all for all those points. Um, really very helpful points. Um, really, um, I think every one of them is relevant. So let's go back to our slides. So that's the that's the slide we've just shown. Okay, right. So so what do we know about men's mental health? Because I I, I thought we'll start by I didn't want to go into stats and depression and suicide. Those are very grim figures. And I thought that's the easiest way to lose men on this or to lose everyone on this call. So let's talk about things that are relatable first. Let's engage first. Let's have a conversation first. Let's let's be, be able to see ourselves in these conversations before we then go ahead and start talking about what the stats look like in terms of men's mental health. So what do we know? To start with, recently in March 2023 or May 2023, 2024, we're in 2024, aren't we? <laughs> in May 2024, uh, there was a study carried out to look at the mental health of the world. It's called Global Mental State. And if you Google it, it's there. It's a large report. They looked at the, um, literally, they, 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 they were able to gain data from a third of the total number of countries in the world. That's hugely representative because there's what is called the, 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 there's what is called the principle of rep representation in which if you're able to take only um, 
about 1,500 um, samples from a from a representative sample, then you you would um, you would have had a sort of a very good hint about what's happening in the group in the total sample. But in this case, we are actually looking at a third of the world population, uh, third of the world countries were sampled. What did they find? They found that there hasn't been any difference much in the level of anxiety and depression since COVID. Uh, and they also found that young adults who have been a main concern uh, in the COVID years, um, lockdown years, continue to um, have poor mental health. In fact, they even found out that there's been a reversal in the UK recently. There was uh, there was um, another study that showed that there has been actually a reversal of the curve in which previously 10, 20, 20, about 20 years ago, the young adults between the ages of 18 and 35 were the ones who reported their the best and optimal mental health. Currently, they are the ones at the bottom of the ladder, really at the bottom of the rung, reporting exactly the opposite. So, and that's another um, area, that's another area of attention, young men, the Gen Zs, our Gen Z men, and our, uh, our young, uh, our millennial men. There are also people that we really need to be paying attention to. Um, it's not just what I've read in, in literature. It's what I see every single day. It's, uh, and that's outside of work. So it's not just what I've read in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a research paper. It's what um, it, it, it's daily experience of what I see in interacting with Gen Z men and millennial, millennial male uh, men outside of church. So outside of church, <laughs> outside of work. Uh, so what do we know about men? We know that there are certain conditions that are commoner in men, ADHD, autism. There are a lot commoner in men than in their boys or male gender than the female gender. We also do know that um, the ability, there's research showing that men's ability to recognize mental symptoms is less than that of ladies. That men are more likely to trivialize mental symptoms than women, and as a result, will not ask for help. We also do know that men are more likely to talk to their GPs about physical problems than to talk about mental problems. And then we also do know that when prescribed medication, men are less likely to take them than, than women are, and that on the overall, men are less likely to engage with GPs than, than uh, women. Of course, the sad outcome of that is what I shared earlier the suicide rate that is I'm, I'm, obviously I'm, I'm not so here I'm not it's, this is not a, a war between the genders it's not it's by no means that and I'm, I'm sure that the, lead, lead, the very good ladies who are on the call tonight that's not the way they see it they actually see it as how can we help our men because I hear it every day honestly I hear it every day women who from either the mom the dad or the, the mom the sister the wife usually or the spouse who says really uh, i need help for 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 the important man in my life it could be uh, it could be that brother it could be what, uh, what can we do to help this person so uh, so what's the so the sad outcome is that all over the nations globally suicide rate is commoner among men or among males than it is among females so what do we know about mental the mental statistics of men uh, again uh, we do know, for instance, that even though mental conditions are commoner on the, co particularly common mental conditions are commoner in women than in men. In the UK, for instance, we have, in the UK, for instance, one in six uh, female will report common mental conditions such as anxiety and depression. And in, in men, it's one in eight. So the ratio is less. Men, less men have those conditions. But guess what? Two out of three men admit to overwhelming feelings um, or feeling overwhelmed in the last year. And also only one in three, only one in four feel that have someone in their lives to be able to speak to. So basically the question is, is it the reason, is, do we feel, is this a, an anomaly? Is this a false, is this a false uh, impression that men don't really have as much common mental conditions or report as many, much common mental conditions as women because we don't talk about it? Also interesting is the fact that that, uh, that only one out of three referrals for talking therapies, which is, which is now called uh, NHS talking therapies in the UK is for men. So two, women are, uh, so for every two women that are referred, one man is referred. So it's almost twice, women are twice as likely to talk, to be referred for talking therapy. 
and then it, it comes very interesting because depression increases the risk of suicide by 20-fold. Women are twice as likely to be depressed as men. However, so one would have expected that uh, from those figures, if women are twice as likely to be depressed and men, um, uh, and, and depression increases the, for the risk of suicide by 20 fold. It stands to reason that there should be more men, more women. And, and like I'm saying, I'm saying this, these are all figures. So what, what would have thought that there should be more women um, dying from suicide as a result than men? But that's what's called, is, is the gender paradox in, in, in suicide in which we, 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 we are still trying to get ahead around it. For instance, we do know in the UK, uh, globally, men are twice as common to take to, to, to die by suicide than women are. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that you can see, you can ident you can note or pick up on my language that I'm saying I'm not using the word commit suicide because that's another thing that, that that's another language that sort of uh, uh, excommunicates people and, and uh, sort of alienates people. <clears throat> so 75% of suicides in the UK occur in men. So for every four suicides, three of them are in men. And in you, when you look at Europe, uh, when you look at America, for instance, the suicide in men is three to 3.5 times common, just like it's the same figure in Australia. So Australia and, and, and America, men are 3.5 times come, uh, more likely to die by suicide than women are. And also in uh, in in Europe, as, as uh, just looking at Europe as a continent, is about four to five times common. Um, it's higher in places like Russia. Um, and the other interesting thing, we do know that suicide and alcohol almost dovetail each other. And men are twice as likely to have problematic drinking than women. So let's look at depression in men, because this place, this, this because they, they are telling a story. We've said that Men are half, half as likely as women to be depressed, yet men uh, die a lot more from suicide than women. So what we have found, what's, what's known is that sometimes depression in men is missed because it doesn't come in the cloak of depression. It doesn't come with low mood. Um, it doesn't come with you know, losing enjoyment of life, low energy. Sometimes it comes in a different cloak. It comes in a different apparel. It comes in a different suit. And because the man is suited and witted, everybody thinks he's on top of his game, he must be really acing it and he must be really winning. When in actual sense, he drags himself. Look at that gentleman, the, 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 the director of, of, of public, primary public health um, in that video. He was quite a very high, he had a very high profile job. And, they, they, and he said he dragged himself out of bed. The, reality, the, the chances are that maybe people who, who, who he was even working with were not aware at the time that, um, that maybe they were not even aware that he, he was he was depressed because what he described in that video was classical of depression. Okay, right. So, um, what are the ways that men then present with depression? Sometimes it's anger, outbursts, and violence. And why? Because the only the only emotion that society, modern society, allows men to express is outbursts of anger. It's to be stoic, it's to be in charge all the time. So men think that that's the only way, that, that, that that's the only acceptable form. So many times, anger outbursts and acts of violence, um, being brittle, being irritable, many times is actually a cry for help for men. And if we're able to look beyond that, we might actually see that that person is crying for help and that they might be going through it might feel like their life feels like they're hell, having, having an experience of hell on earth. Loss of purpose and direction. And that particularly for younger people, younger men, it just feels like the person doesn't, they don't, they don't seem to have a sense of purpose and direction, hopping from one place to the other in terms of job, in terms of career. Sometimes it's actually a telltale sign that, that that young man is depressed because um, the concentration is so distorted that they can't really make headway. Um, sometimes it's reckless risk-taking, gambling, indiscriminate sexual behavior, um, uh, re reckless business, business activities, reckless business decisions. Sometimes they're actually a sign that all is not well and that that man is depressed. Drinks and drugs. 
men are fixers. So rather than go to the GP or rather like go to the to to uh, to, to the psychiatrist or to, to be referred for for to, to mental services, men want to be in charge. So self medication, meaning I want to treat myself. I I I know I, I know what to do. And what do men turn to? Drink and sometimes drugs. It's common. And the other one that is masked, why sometimes I mean like um, I was sharing earlier today about I, I'm, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but many many times, sometimes men bear, deep, 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 men really put their heads down in work, excessive work and hustling. It's really a symptom of treating that yearning and that deep hunger, that that deep emptiness and that deep um, feeling of loss and feeling of uh, of 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 deep sadness that comes with depression so the man continues to work he begins to work and work and work and work but really what he's trying to do is to try and walk walk his depression away and of course suicide is in red uh, which unfortunately can be um can be a, an outcome so male suicide the paradox we, we've talked about that uh we've talked the other product, the other things that we know is that more females attempt to take their lives than males, but we find that men are like more likely to complete the act, and that men are more likely to use lethal means, hanging, firearms, drowning, um, access to guns, and um, carbon monoxide poisoning. All of those things are common, and it's also been known that men are likely to use quicker methods. So th there is a school of thought that actually believes that when a man sets out to, to do that that sort of thing is because they, 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 they don't want any option. They really want to, they, they just want it out of the way. They, they, they think they're fed up with life and they, they want to quit and they want to quit like yesterday. So lethal means are very uh, co commonly um, used. Uh, more, more suicidal intent in attempters. So it's found that men tend to, when you find a man who's, who's done, done an attempt, many, many times when you dig deep, it's not, they don't say it's a cry for help. They say, actually, I'm sad I didn't succeed because I really, I didn't think I was going to wake up on this side of, of, of eternity. I thought I was going to be um, on, on, the, on, on the other side. Um, and of course, we do also know that that gender disparity tends to increase as men get older. So, for instance, in, the, uh, in, in America, um, I think it's quite a public health concern among men who are in their 80s, the concern about, uh, about the, 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 the rising rates of how those men in their golden years then begin to um, attempt and actually succeed in taking their lives. So that despite is also known to increase. And then the other point that is contrary to the stereotype of society about being, men being stoic and men, men being uh, uh, invincible is this, that there is now evidence also showing that when men go through losses, particularly either a loss of role, employment, spousal role, either to divorce or to death, that it appears the, story, the, the statistics are showing that men tend to cope less than women with those losses, particularly because it's more than, it for, it's for, for a woman, a job loss is more, it, it, it's a job loss. Move on to the next one. For a man, it might be a loss of identity. It might be a loss of status. It might be a loss of breadwinner status. It might be a loss of the lifestyle of their family. So that carries more implication. And um, uh, and people are saying that maybe that's actually having more impact that men, particularly in middle age, tend to cope less well uh, than women when, um, when, when experiencing life events. I mean, I, I can say that I've seen, uh, looking at my friends uh, and just looking at my community, I've seen particularly, this is not something I've, I've done a research on, but I've seen how men cope with parental loss, particularly when men lose their moms in middle age. And I think there's something there that is worth looking at. Obviously, I'm also talking from my own experience, and I'm and, and looking at and, and the, the men in my in my in, in my social circle, the middle-aged men that I see. I think there's something there that needs to be looked at. So, um, symptoms of clinical depression. Uh, this is something I've gone uh, gone over in the past, but really things like hopelessness, worthlessness, helplessness, 
um, are things that I really want to focus on today because really those those might also be things that people see. So whilst I'm conscious of time, what so let's end on a very positive note because all, all of this is really about uh, the important thing is to is to get it really is to equip ourselves with tools that we can use to then better our lives and, and to seek help and to get help uh, and to be on top of our game when we need, when when uh, when life happens. So this is the model that I say I use, and that's that's the model I use in coaching. Um, when, when I coach men, this is the model I use. Um, usually when somebody comes in, I will usually have an assessment of where are you currently in, in your life, um, in, on, on all these, um, in all these um, domains of your life. And trust is right at the bottom, at the rock. But it's, it's almost like the rock, the foundation in terms of managing our mental well-being because there is now, it's, 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 a, it's a, almost a universal load of research showing and that people have dedicated their life's work to studying um, spirit, um, spirituality, mental health, um, religion and mental health and, or, and, and relationships and mental health. And the recurring return is that faith is good for mental health and uh, i've always um, shared that my, my christian faith is a very is something very important to me is it is it is, the, is what keeps me going um, and it's, it's my go-to um, at the times of difficulty but uh, research is also showing that things like gratitude things like forgiveness all of those things are pro mental health they are pro mental well-being um, so uh, i've talked about gratitude after, and then having a sense of purpose investing one's life into something that is beyond one all of those things and of course having a faith in somebody who is beyond who is beyond you somebody who is who, who, who is who has more, more ability than you do and and in that case for me it's, it's god for a lot of people here uh, and all of those recent all of those um all of those figures are very interesting recently i came across actually yesterday or two days ago and i shared it on the whatsapp group uh, uh for those who are on the whatsapp group please go and see andrew uberman's video andrew uberman is uh, quite a very renowned neurobiologist um i think he's got a followership of about a million or so on his so he's quite he is quite a, a very renowned person and interestingly somebody interviewed him i just came across the video and he was talking about the fact that he reads the bible he was talking about the fact about his faith and he was talking about the fact that he is not one of those neuro neuroscientists who don't believe in god that he believes in god and that he prays to god i thought that was profound uh, uh with, with the type of um uh, with the type of cloud that he carries yeah it's andrew uberman andrew uberman uh I'm going to type that. Andrew Uberman. Right. Okay. So, 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 and then of course, so that trust is is is, is the solid is the foundation, and of course, then we then go to the next layer of thinking, because. I always say that scripture always aligns with science. Uh, sorry, science always science is catching up with scriptures, and that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Cognitive behavioral therapies, neuroscientists, everything neuroscience is now aligning with that and telling us that the way we think has a lot to do with the way our life is, and that we can also change the way we think. And I'm a living testimony. I, I tell people without being ashamed about it that in changing my thoughts, my life has changed, and that. Just like we shop for food, um, I, I put up my hands that there are certain aisles that I avoid. Uh, I'm sure that some of us who have attended these meetings before know. I always say that when it comes to Christmas, just after October, and the shops start putting out their Christmas pies and their uh, their mince pies and their Christmas puddings, I get very cross because I'm thinking this is so much temptation that they are they are putting my way. So the only way I can avoid those things is to avoid the house where they are stocked. It's not without challenge, but in the same way, just like I'm able to just negotiate with very careful planning, negotiate my way around the shops and not end up with several bean spies and Christmas puddings in my store, in my shopping basket when it's still November. Um, in the same way, we can negotiate the thoughts that we think because they eventually will run our lives. And the interesting thing is that even the thoughts that we think also shape, they actually shape the architecture of our brain. 
uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people believed that the brain architecture does not change. But we now know that every single day, our brain architecture is changing. The, the, the structure of our brains is changing. And it's by the things that we are thinking and the things that, that we are putting into our brains in terms of the exposure as well, um, in terms of the food that we eat and all that sort of thing. So our temple is the body. Our treasures, um, I'm, uh, there's a particular slide, next slide on treasures, which, which I, um, I'm going to hone in on and we're going to do a very quick um, exercise. It's a group exercise, so everyone can do it from in their, wherever you are at the moment. But I think it's a very, it can be powerful. Um, it can be a very insightful and informational one. And the other one is managing our time. We are in the social media era, era that there's literature over literature over literature as well, showing that on unfettered social media time has been associated with increased depression, increased anxiety, increased suicidal behavior, and particularly distorted body image, particularly in young girls. So it's not young, it's not, it's not boys this time, but young girls. So uh, that's that's really key. And of course, trauma is, is, is a different world. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's some, it's, uh, uh, I've, I've done sessions like this that are dedicated particularly to trauma. And really, I describe myself as a trauma-informed coach because that, that's because the impact of trauma in the person who is coming at, or who, is, who is across the room or who is across the, the platform from me um, is something that's really very key. And of course, that then, when all of this has been taken care of, we find out that almost automatically we develop the skills to handle our tasks. And that includes whatever vocation we do. Uh, because also a third of people who are, uh, I think they say a third of people who have mental difficulties have linked it one way or the other to their jobs, to their employment. So this is what a larger picture of what I'm, of that pyramid looks like. So breaking down the pyramid, this is what I've been talking about. And I'm just going to focus on two of them. I'm quite aware of time. And um, we can then open up conversations during question and answer, uh, the question and answer period. We've talked about the thoughts already. We've talked about the trust of temple. That's the one I'm going to go into now. They are mad. <laughs> and this is my pitch. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm doing it in a very, very intentional way. I'm slowing down to do it because I think this is one of perhaps the most important part of this conversation. And so I'm taking my time to do it so that it registers, so that it, it, it just resonates, and so that we take action. Depression and anxiety is more prevalent in every chronic physical health condition from cancers to arthritis to diabetes to strokes to heart attacks any to parkinsons any chronic physical condition is associated with higher risk of mental conditions particularly depression and anxiety where does that what's the meaning of that in all of this in talking about men's health the implication of that is this that looking after our physical well-being in terms of what we eat, a balanced diet, in terms of exercising, and particularly in terms of doing well men checks can be one of the greatest investments into our mental well-being. And I want to say that again, that looking after our physical bodies, our temples, our sacred temples, our very, fine, very intricately woven temples, looking after them in a very intentional way could be one of the greatest investments, not only into our mental well-being currently, but also for the future. Brain health is meant, mental health is at the bottom line brain health. The health of our brain has a lot to do with the health of our emotions. And I always say this, that there are certain things, it, so we know without a doubt that we, we men don't do, we don't engage with well, well made checks well, we don't engage with uh, regular checks well, we don't visit our chip is well, well, uh, well enough. I, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise up the answer or anything like that. But I'm just wondering in this room, how many people responded when the NHS sent them a letter and said, come in to check your blood pressure, come in to have your blood stopped. I plead with you there, brothers. I plead with you there, men. Particularly if you've crossed the 40 age bracket, please go in for your well-made checks. And if you are 
anywhere beyond that and you haven't done it uh, in your 40s if you haven't done it in the last five years then please do one please book let it be the if if it's the only thing you are going to do from today from today's meeting please do it i i plead with you and if you're in your 50s i i, I do my well well man check every single year when my birthday comes around in january i know it's a reminder that i need to do and go and the ladies in our lives my my wife helps me to keep on top of that she she's she's always asking me darling when are you going to go and do have you got the results of your blood test and so one of the women ask me a lot how can we support our men this is one of the things you can do to support your men to keep on top of of nudging them in a loving way to do their well men check and that includes just going in um, having blood done um and of course for black men as well things like psa a uh, prostate, prostate specific antigen is a marker for uh, it's a it's, it's a fairly good marker to um, um, era, to highlight whether there's any concern about prostate cancer. And we do know that prostate, prostate cancer is a very common thing, particularly in black men. Routine blood checks, and that should include vitamin D as well. Um, in terms of taking care of our bodies, exercise, um, good diets, um, staying hydrated. And a lot of men, I run a clinic for the DVLA. Um, they are the they, they they are the authorities that regulate how men, uh, people who drive AV vehicles are, 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 are monitored. A lot of men, they come to the assessment and I say, what's your weight? Oh, I don't know. Oh, wait. Oh, I don't know. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. How, how tall are you? Oh, uh, I checked last, last oh, that was 10 years ago. So a lot of us men don't know our weights. We don't know our body mass index. We don't know our weight circumference. And these are little things that we can do that can actually help us to monitor our physical health, to give us a, 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 a inkling about how what direction our physical health is going. F um, fit test, I've said, FIT test. It's really um, going to the GP, particularly in the UK, the United States. It's it's a, it's something that I, and, and in most Western nations, developed nations of the world, they take a stool test, they test it, they put it under the microscope to look for blood blood as, um blood cells that the eyes cannot see. And if it passes a particular level, they then order more tests. Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a colonoscopy, really put, passing the camera. And a lot of people can, a lot of bowel cancers can be picked up very early. Uh, they say it takes about five to 10 years for bowel cancer to develop into a place in which it becomes um, it becomes a fatal, it, it grows to the point in which it's then in, inevitably fatal. How about if it's picked up early? Well, one would have been doing one's family a lot of a lot of uh, of good. ECGs, particularly ECGs, if if somebody's got comes from a family with um, uh, um, heart conditions, um, it's always good to to get that um, uh, to get that done. <laughs> so sunlight um, and let's watch out for caffeine and and alcohol. I mean, I know. The school of every different people that belong to belong to different schools of thoughts when it comes to alcohol. Um, I don't drink. Um, I've never been a drinker and I don't miss it. But um, I know different people have different thoughts on that. But just to say that also alcohol use can become damaging to mental health. So we've done temple. Let's do treasures. Treasures. The greatest treasure in terms of managing our mental health is you. It's that man. It's that man. That the, uh, relationships are part of it, uh, finances are part, are part of it, uh, understanding, but what the human, the man himself or, and the woman, as the case may be, is the most important treasure. And that's why this this is, in, you can see that huge, um, huge uh, stone of diamond, uh, because you are the gem and it's, it's taking care of you. And I've said, in sometimes we get lost in role as men. We are dad, or we'll start to start with we are husband or, or fiancé or, or boyfriend, um, uh, and we are um, dad, CEO, pastor, church leader, professional leader, um, and also uncle, brother, son, father, all of those roles. And sometimes the person, the you, gets lost in those roles. And I hear it and see it all the time. That, that that person is so engrossed in their role that they, they are no longer in contact with who the, the, that person really is. And I, I encourage you to please take this exercise to look at what makes you come alive. What are your interests? What chills you out? What are your likes and dislikes? 
And when you get triggered, what calms you down? I mean, I would say that I, I did this exercise myself actually today because uh, I thought if I'm going to be serving it to other people, I need to do it myself. I've been doing it in the past, but I, I did it today again. And I'm going to show you what the outcome was. What are your likes? What are your, what's your primary distress emotion? It's not just anger. There are other things that, that we also express. What's your next small step you can take to take care of you? What are you, are you going to join the gym? Are you going to start going on a walk? Or have you had some trauma in your life that you think, okay, now this is the time I'm really going to seek help about this. Or you are going to say, oh, I've not, I've, I've not even communicated with my friend in the last two years. One of the things they say about high achieving men is that sometimes they then get to the pinnacle of their career and they are so lonely. And one, that's one of the other reasons why sometimes people then get to the cliff and they jump. Cliff of the career, and they just look around and they are by themselves. The family has been compromised in the process of hustling up the top. They, everyone is gone and suddenly everything that needs to be achieved is achieved, but then it's a very lonely place. And what's the point? So who will, um, who will help you along the journey? Who is going to help you along that journey? And what's the what are you going to, when are you going to take the first step in keeping with what we just said about really the law of diminishing um, intent? Um, right. Uh, okay, so that's what my avatar looks like. It's not fully done yet because the interesting thing about this process is I've, I put Ayodele on the forehead of that man. I enjoy walking. I, I like sea and sun. I, I like sea and sand and sun. Uh, and people will see that that um, mean spice and Christmas puddings are conspicuously absent from that list. And that's because I'm a recovered, um, uh, I'm a recovered Christmas pudding and mean spice dependent man. So that, that's, that's work in progress and thankfully I'm winning on that. And they've been replaced with nuts. I'm trying to eat as many, uh, stock, stock the fridge with as much carrots and fruits and apples, green apples are my favorites. So, um, and, um, so what winds me up, um, I what winds me up, I don't like things being out of place, things not being put in their proper places. Um, I I don't like being um, I don't like when people don't stay in their lane. Um, and I don't like other people who are on the mind other people. I don't like disloyalty. Those are the things. Uh, and I want to see myself as somebody who is kind. I, I also a foodie. I I enjoy food in terms of not not to the not that I go for go, go uh, not that I splurge on food but that I really like the taste of food I like food with texture and taste and spice and thankfully my wife is a very very good cook it's it's taking all the gods and all the cell so, um, all the self discipline to to try and keep things on the level in terms of managing all these things I've been speaking about uh, so, but I encourage you, please do this, do, do this exercise. I'm, I'm sure our ladies will enjoy it as well. And of course, I always say I'm an introvert and I know people don't believe that. They think, oh, yeah, it doesn't come across as one. But I get my energy from interacting with myself and that's fine. I've made peace with that. And I'm hoping that people who are either extroverted or introverted who haven't made peace with that, I'm hoping that this will encourage you to come on that journey. Um, I, I, maybe I've become an ambivert, but <laughs> so in rounding up, please don't suffer in silence. You are not alone. Uh, please do ask for help, reach out for help. Let's continue to challenge the stigma and the challenges that men face in terms of our mental health. Love. And that, that includes women challenging it, men challenging it. Let's find our own safe place. That Dr. Neighbor, the Dr. Neighbor was the one who, um, who, uh, featured in that video. He found his safe place. He found his three friends and they walked every single week. Let's find our safe places. Um, let's practice saying when we are not okay, okay and let's practice reaching out and being in touch with our emotions. As I round up, I'm beginning to uh, rush a bit now. Uh, as I round up as well, what can we do as community? I think for once we can begin to challenge the traditional view of where man is. And, and whenever we hear anyone say, oh, it's, it's not manly because it's showing emotions, uh, because it's crying at his daughter's wedding, people think, oh, oh that's not, yeah, it's crying at his daughter's wedding because he's, he, he's, he's got a very emotional, strong emotional bond with, um, with, that, uh, with that daughter. And of course, he's giving her away now 
Um, and he's going to be, he's, he's, he's quite, he's going to be careful, no matter how much he believes in the man. I'm putting up my hands now and, and saying that I, I think I'm going to crown my daughter, throw up my daughter's wedding but because of joy, but it's, it's okay. It's, it's fine. I can live with that. Um, introduce conversations about mental to young boys from birth. It's okay to cry. Uh, let's talk about it. How does that feel like? Let's begin to give young men, um, young boys, um, teenagers, um, uh, school children, school boys, the language of emotions and to help them to feel comfortable about saying how it really feels rather than throw a tantrum. Let's talk about it. Let's know what, tell me exactly how it feels like. Create a culture of habitually checking in with men in our world, particularly when things are not going right. Particularly when just really, uh, today I sent somebody a, a text message because, uh, and it, it's, uh, 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 it's like the fourth or fifth text message I'm sending to them. But I'm quite, ever so often, I just, I'm not pressing, I'm just saying, I'm here. Uh, if you do need to talk, I'm here, I'm available, and it will be my privilege um, to be able to do it. Um, let's create a culture of openly supporting and accepting manly the emotions. When the man breaks down at his daughter's wedding, let's hand him a tissue and put our hands around him and say, I'm proud of you, bro. Um, you are showing the world that it's okay to do these things. <laughs> Uh, develop uh, skills to negotiate difficult conversations with men. Uh, I think we've talked about that, and uh, the A to G is a very good one. And then I think uh, mask uh, our men role models they need to continue to do these things. And of course, I think we need to continue to encourage our young boys from a very early age to think about becoming mental professionals, becoming, becoming psychiatrists, becoming psychologists, particularly. I think we need a lot more. Mailed. Uh, I think Dr. Eve, Dr. Eve Sato is somewhere in the house, and I think she would agree with me that we need a lot more men in those roles. Um, and and the women who are doing a great job of it are very keen to have us men in there. So, really, um, I think most of that I've talked about. Um, that's just a summary slide, really. Uh, we need to. Society is playing a lot of role in this, and. So we are society. Those are this Netflix series Beyond Men and Masculinity. If you're on Netflix, it comes highly recommended. Um, it comes really highly recommended. It really looks into the head of me, in, into the psyche of us men, and, and I thought they get, they got us really well. Um, and that, that TED Talk as well is a very good one. Home at last is freedom from body school pain. One, there's quite a lot, there's some literature as well about how boarding school trauma is affecting men, uh, particularly in the UK. Um, that used to be the case that um, boys were the ones that were sent to boarding school and they, they, were, they were the elite group, but the trauma that, that, that in there. So this guy uh, is actually a believer, um, Mark Stibble. Max Tibble. He is written and he runs retreats actually. Um, he's not a psychotherapist. He runs retreats for men who have actually had such problems. Uh, and that's my, a video that I recorded, which is this one. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. So how to help men talk about emotions. Uh, it, it's going to about 800 views now. It was recorded about um, seven months ago. And I at this risk of being self-serving, honestly, honestly, I recommend this video to you. Uh, if you are looking for skills, men or women who are looking for skills to really be able to engage us in, in talking about those emotions, this is one video to check out. It's on the Tripart Care Emotional Wellbeing Hub, uh, Tripart Care YouTube channel. If you type in Tripart Care over there, um, it will bring it up for you. And it's how to help men talk about emotions. Really, I, I think it's a very rich video. Um, and then that's another resource. Um, WWR, the Australians have done quite a lot of work in terms of mental health for men, actually. Um, Are You OK is a very good resource. It's, a, it's, 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 it's got lots of videos on there in terms of really engaging men, men who are working in construction, men from all walks of life, and how to have those conversations. Men's Shared, like I spoke about earlier, is also another good one. For ladies or other men who are experiencing, encountering problems with engaging men in their lives in terms of getting them to seek help. The hacenter.org and leapinstitute.org are very good resources to find ideas. The, the leap, leap, leap is about, it's, it's listen, empathy, um, agree, and partner. 
really using the, those four things to try and engage people who are not currently um, seeing the need for help. And Papyrus is really for young people, both men and women. Right. Okay. So um, the announcement I was going to make is that uh, after a lot of reflection, I, I do think that one of the things that I, I I'm keen to get into now is to do a few one-to-one -one sessions. It's going to be very highly selective um, in terms of doing four weeks um, informed trauma-informed coaching for men who really want to go to the next level um, and they feel that there's something that's holding them back. I, I've, I've been a beneficiary of that in the past and I really feel that that's one of the places where my heart is now um, offering that four-week one-to-one spiritually um, spiritually attuned, culturally sensitive, tailored and niched, and it's goal focused. Uh, for inquiries, please um, just send an email on tripadcare at gmail tripadcare at gmail com. And um, these are the other things that tripadcare does. Um, yeah, I, I, I quite enjoy speaking in public, keynote public speaking. And we do also have a book club. Uh, I, I said earlier, we read the book, the book that we are reading at the moment. And also workplace mental well-being uh, um, training. Um, just that it's different titles that we could deliver on. And for those who want to join the WhatsApp group, that's the generic WhatsApp group. It says young adults, but... The, the older adults have one way or the other, or the middle-aged adults and all the adults have one way or the other found themselves on the group. And it's okay, uh, come one, come all. So um, if you could just take, if you are interested, please take a photo of that. Uh, that's the QR code. It will lead you to the group and then I can, uh, we can accept you into the group. Uh, we, and for those who are ministers, particularly pastors, church leaders, church, or church plan, marketplace ministers, that this is really a group for, this is another group. It's for marketplace ministers. And that's because sometimes leaders encounter things to do with their mental well-being that are peculiar to leadership. It's because of the role of, the, of being a leader. It becomes more isolated as well. And that's why that group exists. And then that's the final slide. And thank you all for staying with us.